Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is very recent. It's a very ongoing case and for how recent it is, we actually have a good bit of information for how the investigation started to how it led to a suspect within a matter of days. But before we get into it, I want to take a quick moment to remind you all that I did recently start a new Facebook page. I post shorter form videos on that page where I discuss cases that I've covered here on this channel and will continue to cover in the future. So if you want to see shorter summaries of cases that I've covered, or if you just want to support me and my work, please give that Facebook page some love. Okay, so with that shameless plug, let's get into the case. So this case is going to start a bit different than how I normally cover cases because with this case, it doesn't start with a missing persons report or even knowing who the victim is. This case starts by a witness finding a suitcase and discovering that there are human remains inside. And from there, police go on the hunt to find the person responsible for leaving these various suitcases. This is a very recent case, like I said, but I was able to look over the affidavit of probable cause, which gives a really nice outline of what exactly happened in the case and how they found the person responsible. This case starts on July 21st, 2023. So just a couple weeks ago, by the time I'm recording, recording this video. On July 21st, Delray Beach Police in Florida received a call from a witness who said that they had been visiting a property that belonged to a friend and they were feeding that friend's farm animals when they spotted a suitcase on the west side of the Intracoastal Highway. This witness said that when they looked closer at the suitcase, they saw that there was a human foot sticking out of the zipper. So of course, police responded to the call and when they arrived, they found the suitcase in question. They opened up that suitcase and inside they found a pair of human legs as well as several small landscaping rocks. On the outside of the suitcase, there appeared to be an airline barcode sticker with the name Barbosa on it. About an hour after receiving that call, Delray Beach Police received a second call. This time, it was from a witness who said that they spotted a suitcase on top of some rocks along the west side of the Intracoastal Highway. This caller said that the suitcase contained human remains inside as well. When police responded to this call and opened up that suitcase, there was a human torso inside. This torso was missing the head and the hands, so it sounds to me like it had the arms up until the wrists, and then the torso ended just below the stomach area. There were also several small landscaping rocks found within this suitcase as well. Now, while they were on the scene investigating this second suitcase, this witness told the officer that his friend was on another boat around the same area, and he had located another suitcase near the water as well. This suitcase was facing the east side of the Intercoastal Highway, and it was a bit more south from the area where this second suitcase was located. Once again, they found that suitcase to also have human remains inside. Officers arrived to the other scene and obtained that third suitcase. Inside suitcase number three was a pelvis that belonged to a female. I'm not exactly sure if the pelvis still had like the skin on it and the genitals so you could tell it was a female or if they knew this because females typically have wider pelvises and men have a more narrow pelvis. So I don't know if that's how they figured that it was a female or by their genitals. But either way, this suitcase also had a bag inside of it that was from the Cheesecake Factory. And once again, there were multiple small landscaping rocks, and this time there were also several large-sized barnacles inside the suitcase as well. So, all three of these suitcases with human remains were found on July 21st, 2023. So, following that day on July 22nd, the county launched a multi-agency marine operation in that intercoastal waterway within the city of Delray Beach. As they were searching, a Delray Beach Coast Guard vessel found a tote bag that was tied shut around the handles with twine. Then, that bag also appeared to have a men's belt wrapped around the outside. Once they opened the tote bag, they found probably the last of the human remains. They found the head of a female inside that bag. 
and upon further inspection, it appeared to investigators that there was a gunshot wound behind the woman's ear with an exit wound behind the opposite ear. Of course, based on the location of the gunshot wound and the fact that this woman clearly didn't shoot and dismember herself, the medical examiner ruled her manner of death as a homicide and the cause of death being a gunshot wound to her head. After finding the fourth bag, the underwater search and recovery team continued their searches. As they searched, they located a purse just slightly north of where they found the tote bag. This purse was tied shut with the same kind of twine used to tie the duffel bag shut. In the purse, they found an ashtray, which they think was used as a weight to make the purse sink. They noticed that the purse also had an odor of decomposition, but as far as I have seen, there were no actual remains found within the purse. My thought is that maybe the hands were in the purse since the hands hadn't been found, but they may have fallen out at some point since they're a lot smaller and are a lot more likely to fall out of a bag and get lost in the water. The following day on July 23rd, police started speaking with witnesses around the areas of where these bags and suitcases were located. So the first two witnesses was a couple named Martin and Denise. This couple lived near where the third suitcase was found. They told detectives that they actually saw the suitcase on the waterway a few days before detectives found it. Obviously, they didn't know that the suitcase had human remains in it, otherwise they probably would have reported it. Either way, they did say that for the few days before investigators found that suitcase, they noticed a white male in his 50s or 60s looking around the area where the suitcase was. They said that it looked like this man was looking directly at the suitcase that was lying there. The same man came back and forth to the area around five or six times over the course of three days. So, the couple went up to this man and asked him what he was looking at, and he said that he was waiting for a big boat to come into the harbor. The couple told him that there was no big boats coming in because the water was too shallow, so they asked him what kind of boat he was waiting for. Then he pointed to a boat that was across the waterway, and he said, a big boat like that. According to the couple, the man appeared fidgety and nervous when they spoke with him, and after they spoke with him, the man immediately left, getting into his older model sedan and drove away. Then, police spoke with other witnesses who were construction workers working on the roof of a property that was right by where the third suitcase was found. From the roof, they had a clear view of the suitcase, and they too said that they had seen the suitcase in the days before police recovered it. They told investigators that on July 21st, they saw a white male in his 50s or 60s with the same description that the other couple gave lurking around the area where the suitcase was found. They said that they saw this man standing on the edge of the seawall looking right at the suitcase. But then, all of a sudden, they heard the man yell, shit, before he immediately got into his old model gold Ford sedan and left the area. So, again, those second witnesses were able to not only say that he drove in an old model gold sedan, but they said that the make was a Ford. While police were still in this area, they noticed a metal dock ladder right by where suitcase number three was located. Upon looking closer at the ladder, they saw that most of the ladder was covered in barnacles, but the bottom step was completely clean. So, police contacted the crime scene unit to see if they could recover prints or any other evidence from that ladder. So, they collected the ladder, and when they did, they saw that there was a small amount of blood on that ladder. And after testing, they confirmed that it was, in fact, human blood on that ladder. Then, another witness came forward to police who said that on July 20th, they saw a man with the same description as given earlier using the ladder that police had just tested to lower into the water. They said that this man was using the ladder. They said that the man was holding what looked like a brush with a metal pole in his hand. They said that the man appeared to be trying to push or scrape something in the waterway using that brush in a downward motion. By July 30th, police were able to obtain a surveillance video that actually captured the area where that ladder was. They saw that on July 20th at 7.04 a.m., 
there was an older looking man with gray hair climbing down the ladder before leaving the area. Then the same man was seen on video again at that dock ladder at 4.13 p.m. the same day. This time, he was not wearing a shirt and he's carrying what appears to be a Cheesecake Factory bag, which looked to be pretty full and heavy. He is also seen carrying a metal pole. This man is then seen climbing down the ladder so far that he's no longer seen on surveillance camera. Then six minutes later, he is seen climbing back up the ladder and he's no longer carrying that bag. The man then takes off his shoes and walks out of frame. Police then went to the area to see if they could find those shoes and lo and behold, they found the same pair of shoes on the dock. So as police were doing all of this investigative work, Police had also put out a bolo or a be on the lookout for the car that was described by those witnesses. By July 31st, a detective was able to capture surveillance images of a 2008 gold Ford Taurus in the area, which did capture the license plate tag. The surveillance camera picked up the car on July 24th at 11.30 a.m., driving in an area that was only 0.3 miles away from the dock ladder and 0.1 miles away from where that third suitcase was found. When they ran the plates, they found that the car was registered to a 78-year-old man named William Lowe Jr. And upon running his name through the system, they found that his picture was exactly what the witnesses described, an older man with gray hair. They also found his address, and at that address, they found that someone else was registered as living there. They found that a woman named Adel Barbosa, who was William's wife, was also living at that address. And remember, as I stated before, one of those suitcases that were found had a sticker on it that literally said Barbosa. So police arrived to the address listed and they made contact with William. But his wife, Adol, she was nowhere to be found. So police asked William where his wife was and he told them that she had been in Brazil. They asked how long she had been there and he said that she had been in Brazil for three weeks. They asked him follow-up questions like how she got to the airport and he said he didn't know. He also didn't know what airline she flew on and he also said that he didn't know when the last time was that he spoke with his wife. Obviously, that was a red flag because you would think that someone would remember at least a window of time when they spoke with their spouse last, especially if they're out of the country and traveling, you would want to keep up with them and what they're doing to make sure they're okay. But he basically said that he had no idea of any of this. Police asked William if he had recently fallen or cut himself or scraped himself at all recently, and he said, other than shaving, no. Then police showed William a picture of the two suitcases that the human remains had been found in, and he was asked if he recognized any of the suitcases, and he said no. So he was asked why one of the suitcases had a sticker that said his wife's last name on it, and he also said that he did not know. So based on the evidence that they found within the suitcases and with the witness statements, as well as surveillance video, police were able to obtain a search warrant for William's home. Inside the home, detectives said that they found a blood spatter all throughout the home, including in the living room, the dining room, the hallway, both bathrooms, and the master bedroom. They found traces of blood within the shower drains in the master bathroom, as well as in the second bathroom. Then they found evidence of drag marks in the living room, the hallway, and the master bedroom. They also found large amounts of blood in the living room, dining room, and master bedroom. It looked like there had been an attempt to clean up all of the blood, and they found tons of cleaning supplies throughout the residence, some of which also had blood spatter on them. Then, of course, police had sent over the remains to the medical examiner as soon as they found them in those suitcases. Like I said, they said that this woman had died as a result of homicidal gun violence. But she also used dental records to confirm that the body did in fact belong to 80-year-old Adel Barbosa. Police weren't exactly sure what Adel looked like, so based on her DNA, they said that she was most likely a white or Hispanic woman. They also released a sketch of what she most likely looked like. 
They also released pictures of the suitcases and the clothes that she was found in. They said that the clothes that they showed pictures of, they're similar to what she was wearing, but not exactly the same thing. I did also find this picture, which I do believe is confirmed to be a real picture of her. I may be wrong, a lot of sources say that we don't know exactly what she looks like, but again, this is a very recent developing case, so I do think this is a picture of her. And one of the funny things in this case that made the headlines was that obviously, while they were executing the search warrant, William was not inside of the home, nor was he allowed to go inside. But as they were searching, William was caught trying to sneak into the residence using a rear window. Obviously, officers prevented him from getting inside, and William said that he was just trying to get his phone and his keys to his storage unit. So, police looked in the areas of the home where William said these items were located, and on the desk, they found the business card to the storage unit, as well as his keys, his wallet, his driver's license, and his credit card. Then, within a drawer of that same desk, police found a 9mm handgun. While searching his apartment, other detectives went around to speak with neighbors to see if they knew anything about William and his wife. One of the neighbors said that she had lived in that apartment for over two years, and she knew her neighbors as Bill and his wife, whose name she did not know how to say. She said that she hadn't seen the wife, though, in at least several weeks. She also told police that on that same day, so July 31st, she was out walking her dogs at 8 a.m. in the morning when she saw William putting a plastic container tote box into his car. She also explained to the police that any times the dogs would hear movement going on in the apartments around them, they would bark. She said that the dogs have been barking at night between 1.30 and 3 a.m. for several nights in a row, which she thought was very odd. When she woke up and listened, she said that she could hear William's door opening and shutting multiple times between those hours each night for several nights in a row, and this was very strange to her. Then, another neighbor stated that the apartment right above William's belonged to William's sister. So, to avoid confusion, William lives in apartment number four and his sister lived in apartment number eight in the floor above William. Well, the neighbor said that she hadn't seen the sister in at least two years, but she still owns that apartment. She said that William does have keys to that apartment and she sees William going into that apartment at least a few times per month. She said that she knows William stores items in that apartment and uses the fridge in there as well. She told police of an incident that she thought was two to three weeks prior, where she said that she saw what looked like a trail of soup leading from the door of apartment four, so William's apartment, through the hallway, up the stairs, and then stopping at apartment eight, so William's sister's apartment. Police confirmed this story with the apartment's custodial staff, who said that they did clean up a stain, but they weren't exactly sure when that occurred, but they did confirm that that stain was there and that it led from William's apartment through the hallway up the stairs to his sister's apartment on the floor above him. Again, the cleaner said that it was just a few weeks before the time of this interview, which was August 1st, but he wasn't sure of the exact date when he cleaned up that mess. Police then looked around the area in the apartment complex, so around the floors and the doors and all of the different units, and they noticed what looked like a small amount of blood spatter on a wall next to the entry of the door to apartment 8. So again, William's sister. So, based on the witness statements from this apartment, police also got a search warrant to search apartment 8, which they executed that same day on August 1st. In that apartment, they found a black cover that was lying on top of a large object. Under that cover, they found a chainsaw on the dining room table that was connected to a charger. They also found several bottles of cleaning supplies in that apartment as well. Then, as I stated just a few minutes ago, police also found out that William had a storage unit. Well, they also got a search warrant for that storage unit, which they executed on August 2nd. When searching the storage unit, police found a pretty gruesome scene that kind of confirmed exactly what they needed to know. They found another chainsaw, but on this chainsaw, they found what appeared to be blood on the blade, chain, and the housing of the saw, 
And then when inspecting closer, they found what appeared to be bone matter, flesh, and human hair in the housing of the saw. Next to the saw, they found a large cooler. There appeared to be red marks on the outside of the cooler as well as within the cooler itself. Of course, these stains on and in the cooler are thought to be blood marks. So obviously, police believed based on this evidence that William shot his wife of almost 15 years, killing her, then dismembered her body using that chainsaw and placed her in those suitcases and discarded her in the water. When police released a sketch of what she most likely looked like, police also announced that they believed the murder took place sometime between July 17th and July 20th, but they aren't exactly sure of the date just based on the different witness accounts and how long it would take to dismember a body and when those suitcases appeared that's sort of the estimate that they're able to come up with. Based on the evidence, William was arrested and charged with first-degree murder as well as the abuse of a dead body. He pled not guilty to both charges, and at his bail hearing, he was denied bail. As of right now, we don't know any sort of motive. We don't know why this happened. We don't know much about the relationship between William and his wife. William isn't speaking right now and has hired an attorney to work his case. Investigators on this case say that this is probably one of the worst cases that they have ever seen. It's a very disturbing situation overall, and it looks really bad for William. But William's attorney has since come out to say that the allegations just don't align with William's character. He was a former Marine who earned a Purple Heart for his service in the Vietnam War. He is also a successful business owner. His lawyer said that he's been a good, valuable citizen for 78 years who had no criminal record and was known to be a decent man. He said that anybody who knows William knows that these charges just don't make sense for who he is as a person. So that is all of the information that we know as of right now. Of course, he is innocent until proven guilty, he's maintaining his innocence, and we don't really know much about him, his wife, or their relationship. Also, he is a 78-year-old man, and I know he's a war veteran, but dang. Transporting a body, dismembering it. I don't want to be graphic, but that takes a lot of physical effort. And I'm not discounting the strength of our elder populations, but that is a lot of work for anybody, let alone somebody in their late 70s. But if you want my opinion, I do think he did it. I think all of the evidence points directly at him. And I think we are going to need a hell of a story to explain away all of that very damning physical and circumstantial evidence. So any information about William or his wife or the relationship that they had or their lives... We will have to wait and find out more. Again, this is a very active and ongoing case. It is still a developing story, so I will do my best to keep everybody updated as more information comes out. As you all know, for the most up-to-date information on any given case, make sure you check out my Twitter. But that is where I'm going to end today's video, and now I want to know what you all think of this insane case. Do you think that William is guilty? What do you think of the evidence against him? Why do you think this happened? Do you think there will be a trial or do you think he'll plead guilty at some point? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you check out my Facebook page as well as my Twitter and Instagram. All of those will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!